just have two items for all of you at the top. Uh, the United States is concerned uh, that the uh, deteriorating security situation is deepening, the humanitarian crisis in Iraq, as we've been discussing in here the last several days. The International Organization for Migration estimates that the number of people displaced by the violence in Mosul and surrounding areas uh, in recent days may have reached 500,000. They join an additional 430,000 people displaced by fighting in Anbar, as well as the nearly 1 million people who remain displaced from the war in Iraq. We uh, are announcing today we're providing an additional $12.8 million to international organization partners working to meet the needs of internally displaced persons and conflict victims in Iraq. The new assistance will provide immediate relief by supplying food, shelter, and medicine for Iraq's rapidly growing population of displaced people. This additional support includes $6.6 million to the UN High Commissioner for Refugees for essential humanitarian supplies like blankets, tents, and hygiene items, and it provides $6.2 million to other international organizations for food and clean water, core relief items, and urgent medical care for the affected. These contributions are in part in response to an additional emergency appeal, uh, the UN United Nations Strategic Response Plan of $104 million issued in March for Iraq. With this announcement, the total U.S. humanitarian assistance to Iraq in fiscal year 2014 is more than $136 million. We urge other donors to help meet the critical needs outlined in this appeal. Since 2010, the United States has contributed to the United Nations, other international organizations, and non-governmental organizations more than $1.1 billion in humanitarian assistance for Iraqi refugees and internationally displaced, internally displaced people. The other piece I just wanted to mention at the top, uh, the United States is deeply troubled by the harsh prison sentence issued yesterday against 25 Egyptian activists for organizing an authorized protest. The defendants were sentenced to 15 years in prison under Egypt's highly restrictive demonstrations law following very irregular court proceedings. This marks at least the third court verdict in the last six months sentencing peaceful protesters to prison under the new demonstration law. We urge Egypt's new leadership to make good on its promise of inclusivity and impartiality consistent with its promise to protect the rights of all Egyptians and govern for all Egyptians. Since last November, the implementation of Egypt's restrictive, dem restrictive demonstrations law has led to a sharp increase in arrests, detentions, and charges against opposition figures, human rights activists, and peaceful demonstrators, and verdicts based on these charges, all of which send a chilling message to the civil society at large. These verdicts do not contribute to a transition process that protects the rights of all Egyptians. Uh, and I just will note we have a bilateral meeting uh, soon this afternoon, so let's try to get through. I know there's a lot going on. Uh, everything we can. Go ahead, Matt. Are you okay there? I just my pen exploded. I've oh. got blue ink all over okay. myself. At least you didn't cut yourself. No, that's true. I feel like I voted in the Afghan election. <laughs> okay. Because of the ink on the fingers. Um, sorry. So, um, in Iraq, mm -hmm. you just announced um, this aid for internally displaced people. Have any decisions been made about, or can you enlighten us on where the process is? On what the president outlined mm -hmm. uh, with the Australian foreign minister in terms of the options being considered for assisting the Iraqi government in dealing with the deteriorating situation. Mm -hmm. Well, what you've seen, and I know you saw it, Matt, but just for the benefit of others, um, the president did speak to this just a little while ago in the last hour. Uh, and what he said and made clear is that uh, we've had a lot of concern, uh, not just uh, in the last couple of days, but months. And what we've seen uh, over the last couple of days uh, is, in, is an indication that Iraq needs more help. Uh, our team is working uh, over time uh, on a range of options. Uh, that does not include, to be clear, boots on the ground. Uh, Secretary Kerry is clearly very engaged in these discussions, which are ongoing. Uh, and, uh, and Deputy Assistant Secretary Brett McGurk, of course, is as well, given he's on the ground, as well as a range of officials uh, from the State Department. I don't have anything to enlighten you on, given these are ongoing discussions, uh, but the President made clear that in the short term, uh, there may be uh, the immediate need for uh, additional military assistance, and uh, there's a, a, an ongoing discussion about that. So immediate means possibly by the end of the day? Or uh, no, I'm, not, no, I'm not giving a, a timing indication. I think what he's indicating is in the short term, in addition to the capacity building that we're doing right. over the medium and long term. Do you have any um, thoughts about the Iranians saying that they're willing to help uh, the 
defend the Shia community or defend Baghdad, uh, and or both uh, the Kurds taking control of Kirkuk. Do these developments cause you any concern? Well, let me take uh, the second one first. Um, we support the steps uh, taken between the federal government and the Kurdish regional government uh, to cooperate on a security plan that will enhance the Iraqi abil uh, army's ability to hold positions and confront ISIL. We're encouraging both Baghdad and Erbil to uh, continue and further their cooperation given the immediate threat uh, that uh, they're all facing from ISIL on the ground. Um, in terms of um, the Iranians, uh, we've naturally seen those statements or seen the reports, I should say, I guess there are statements and reports. Uh, we don't have any confirmation of their presence on the ground, which I think is some of the reports. Um, clearly, we've encouraged um, them in many cases to play a constructive role, um, but I don't have any other uh, readouts or views from our end to, to, to portray here today. You say you've encouraged them in many places. I meant you... Syria as well, obviously, right, 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 completely right. different cir circumstances. I but... understand. Does, is that, does that, has that encouragement taken the form of anything other than you saying it just now in, from the podium? In Syria? Or any, no. Anywhere? No. Has your encouragement of the Iranians to play a constructive role in Iraq, has that come out in any other form other than you just saying it on the podium? In other words, what I'm getting at is have you talked to the Iranians directly about this? And in this case, whether you have or not, could you identify what a, playing them playing a constructive role might mean for well, the U.S. view? I think um, – you know, the, the circumstances and the uh, threats obviously posed um, to a range of countries on the ground is clear. We've talked about that. Um, we know the history here. Um, I don't have anything uh, more to analyze from here in terms of what role they could play. Uh, as you know, uh, the talks that our team has been engaged in with the Iranians in Geneva have focused on the nuclear uh, discussions, and, and that has continued to be the case. So that, that so the, the situation in Iraq has not come up in conversations that Deputy Secretary Burns and Under Secretary Sherman have had with you with the Iranians. No, the focus has been on the nuclear program. Well, okay, the focus might have been it hasn't come up at all. Do, do you're aware of? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay, and I'm just but but playing a constructive <laughs> role. I'm trying to figure out what that might mean in this case. Would you be supportive of the Iranians sending? troops, since you're not willing to send or you don't want to, and presumably the many most Americans wouldn't want you to send to re-invade Iraq, as it were, mm -hmm. um, would, would the Iranians sending troops be a constructive role? Uh, again, Matt, uh, obviously these comments and these reports are new. Uh, I don't have any analysis from our team at this point in terms of what specific constructive role they could play. Just taking you up on that, um, Jen. Do you believe that there is some kind of common approach that the United States could forge with Iran um, on ways to support the Maliki government? Well, I, I think the fact is we've been out there, obviously, long supporting uh, the Iraqi government. You know where the Iranians stand, but I'm just not going to get ahead of where things stand right now. And just to, again, stress, this was not raised at all with the, between Burns, Deputy Secretary Burns and his... Um, team in, in Geneva? The discussions were focused on the nuclear program. And do you have any, sorry, one more for me. Have you got any, um, the Iraqi foreign minister was talking in London today, he's attending this conference mm -hmm. that I believe the secretary is going to be at tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so Foreign Minister Zabari said today today that he believes that the the ISIL um, militants were now on the run uh, with the security forces having fought back. Does that coalesce at all with what you're hearing from the ground? Well, there are, um, given how fluid this is, I'm sure it comes as no surprise that there are conflicting reports um, about the situation on the ground and um, the further advances ISIL uh, has made. Um, I've not heard a confirmation of that particular report, but there's also been conflicting reports that I don't have confirmation of either, if that makes sense. So we're obviously tracking this closely. Uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary McGurk is on the ground, as you know, uh, but uh, events are incredibly fluid on the ground. Could you say that your position on Iran has changed because they used to say that uh, Iran's role in Iraq is not constructive, in fact, it's negative and meddling and interfering. So would you say that there has been a change? I don't think I, I indicated, I, I don't think I said very much about our position okay. here. Obviously, right. we've seen the comments. About, so. about these Go options ahead. are not including uh, boots on the ground, that, but it does not preclude, let's say, <coughs> drone strikes, does it? Well, I'm, I'm not going to get into a 
uh, eliminating or adding each thing. I think the President's uh, comments made very clear uh, he has a broad range of options, and I was just making clear that doesn't include boots on the ground. Would you say that the volatility of the situation uh, now has called it, uh, called for, let's say, U.S. interference by air, let's, perhaps by missiles? I'm not going to indicate you know. what, uh, what uh, option it may mean or what options, but clearly the grave security situation on the ground that's been deteriorating every day has warranted uh, our team working overtime on uh, a range of options, and ultimately the President will have to make a decision on what that will be. Additional steps to uh, bolster or support the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, or is there any evacuation plans? Uh, as you know, we would never indicate that in any case uh, in advance, uh, but the security situation we're clearly monitoring as closely as possible. Uh, the U.S. Embassy and consulates in Iraq uh, remain open and continue to operate uh, on a normal status, uh, so I don't have any, indica any uh, plans of uh, any announcements about plans changes to tell you about? Not even a heightened status with regards to the, all the fighting? You're well, not even uh, as you know, we put out a travel warning yesterday, uh, as we often do when we want to provide information that has become available. Uh, this, In this case, it is information that we're all aware of, but uh, we want to make it uh, pointed out to American citizens, and we did that just yesterday. How about the, uh, does the current security framework with Iraq, does that allow the U.S. to conduct kinetic strikes inside Iraq's borders? Uh, well, I think you're familiar with, um, um, you know, where we stand with, uh, you know, post-2011, uh, where our agreements are uh, with Iraq. Obviously, any decision made would, would be taken, would, we would take into account any uh, legal needs at the time. Um, I know the embassy in Baghdad is one of the largest. Do you have an approximate of how many people there are there? I know you don't get into specific numbers, but if you have any sense We of also the size. don't like to provide a range uh, for security reasons, and uh, that's no different in this case. Mm -hmm. Evacuated just the crisis since the crisis began in Mosul. Have you evacuated any American uh, official from the region, from Mosul or from the pro uh, approximate Have regions? we? I'm sorry. Can you repeat? Have we there been was any evacuation from the uh, evacuation from the region for the U.S. Evacuation? Uh, uh, we yeah. don't have a consulate in Mosul. But I mean, in Arbil or any other places, have you? Uh, ever all of our consulates remain up and running uh, as they have been, and we continue to monitor the security situation on the ground. Do you have any update about the Turkish hostages? Do you have? I mean, I, I know that the uh, Secretary Kerry and <coughs> Vice President Biden talked. Uh, uh, yes, and I know you're Turkish aware of that, and obviously watching it closely, I don't have any update beyond. On that. So has the Secretary made any calls uh, related to Iraq today? Uh, he spoke with uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary McGurk this morning again, but uh, no other calls to read out. For okay. Me. So is, 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 is it your understanding, and I realize this is a little bit outside of your lane, but that the Vice President is going to be the one, the main interlocutor with the Iraqis on this, or do, do, does the Secretary plan to meet with, as Joe noted, Zabari is, going to be, is in London already. It, Mm -hmm. there are, There's no planned meeting at this time, but uh, I think in this case, uh, as is the case in many other issues, there's often a uh, team of individuals who who talks to a range of officials. I expect that will be the case here, and if it's helpful for the secretary to make a call, I'm sure that he will. And give it, given the vice president's having had the lead, kind of essentially having had the lead for the administration since for, for the last six, six years, and the fact that when he was in the Senate, he advocated this three-state solution, you know, Kurdistan and then a, uh, the Sunni area and then Shia in the south. It, does, he, can, does the administration still support the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Iraq as it exists today, as it has existed since post-colonial times? Yes, yes, yes. yes. certainly So do. there's no, you have an, you're, you're not aware of any consideration of a tri no. three-way um, no. deal? No. Let me just give you, can I just give an update on uh, McGurk's meetings, just for those of you who it's of interest to? Um, uh, over the past half an hour. It doesn't, but I think it just shows how active he is. So that's why I wanted to make sure you all are aware. And obviously, there's a lot of interest in this issue. Uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Brett McGurk, over the past 24 hours, has met with uh, Deputy Prime Minister Sharistani, uh, with Defense Minister Dulami, Party Chair of the Islamic Supreme Council of Iraq, Amar Hakim. Parliament Speaker New Jafee uh, and the United States Special Representative for Iraq and others. Uh, he remains in Baghdad where he will continue to engage with Iraqi leaders over the next several days. Catherine? How long do you expect him to stay in country? 
I don't have an indication of this of that at this point. He'll be there for the next several days. Uh, I'm sure that's something we'll evaluate day by day. Is he, is he in contact with the tribe leaders? Uh, he was, I think, in the readout I gave yesterday. He had been in touch, uh, so I don't have, not in the last 24 hours, but certainly in the last 48 to 72. Are you concerned about the tribes who changed the side in this conflict? Because according to the press report, some tribes in the region in Mosul are supporting now YSL forces against, against the, the Iraqi, I mean, the Maliki government. And the, are you concerned well, we've, about Well, we've it? seen the reports. As, as I've noted, it's an incredibly fluid situation on the ground. I think our focus is on uh, not just uh, the assistance bucket, which clearly the President spoke to and we've spoken to extensively in here, but also the political bucket and uh, the importance of unity. Um, and so uh, in that vein, uh, any efforts to work with the Iraqi government in, in any capacity is what we're encouraging all sides to do. Thank you, Vice President Biden. In 2010, he was very optimistic about Iraq and said that it could be one of the greatest achievements of the administration. I was wondering if Secretary Kerry thought the same thing. Again, I'd, I'd point you to but the Vice President's office on, on his comments from four years ago. Back to the this. embassy, you can't from that podium even say that you are uh, strengthening security at the embassy at this time? We typically don't discuss uh, security for obvious reasons, um, and if anything changes that would warrant uh, making information available publicly, we do that on a regular basis. Iraq? Yeah, Iraq. Um, did you listen to the pretty strong comments of Senator McCain this morning? I've seen... This? I've seen some tweets and reports of them, yes. So he was asking, uh, to, was asking the president to change his uh, national security team. Uh, what, what, what would you reply to that? Uh, I think I'd point you to the White House on that, Nicholas, but I would uh, make clear that you know, this is a situation uh, where uh, the impact of the uh, ongoing crisis in Syria, the overflow of that uh, into Iraq has clearly been a, a major factor. Uh, we have made uh, taken a range of steps to increase the capacity of the Iraqi security forces and the Iraqi government over the last several months. I'm uh, I'm I'm not sure what uh, Mr. McCain, Senator McCain, is or isn't aware of. I assume he's aware of all of that. And right now, we believe our, all of our focus should be as a United States government, regardless of what party you may be in, and. Uh, making a determination about what steps we can take uh, in the short term uh, to boost their capacity to address the uh, immediate threat from uh, I ISIL. So what steps can you take in the short term? Well, I think uh, you heard the President speak to this, um, but uh, given uh, what we've seen in the deteriorating uh, situation on the ground, uh, that has warranted um, a, a look by the national security team uh, at a range of options. Um, and obviously uh, we'll give them the space to make any decisions about what we'll do. Uh, but we've increased assistance um, over the course of the last several months, uh, given uh, what we've seen on the ground. And uh, I think you heard the President say that uh, this warrants uh, the need uh, to do more, and that's what they're discussing now. There have been concerns, though, over the past um, few days that the Iraqi, in many places, the Iraqi army just fled in the face of the defensive. Mm -hmm. um, there's been billions of dollars of U.S. taxpayer money pay, uh, poured into training and equipping the Iraqi um, government. Has this been squandered? Is it a failure? Well, Joe, obviously the last events of the, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the events of the last several days uh, are clearly um, were alarm they're alarming, and um, I think there's no question about that. Uh, we there was a clear structural breakdown. Uh, we were disappointed by. Uh, the reaction of or the uh, steps uh, that were taken by a range of uh, security forces, but uh, our commitment to Iraq is long-term. Uh, we share a commitment to addressing uh, the threats uh, from groups like ISIL, and that's why we are continuing to take steps and consider steps to increase their capacity. And do you have an analysis of what the cause of the uh, structural breakdown was? Why did this happen? That is something uh, the Iraqi central government is looking uh, into, um, and I don't have any updates uh, at this point. And do you on believe what their that the Iraqi, are. sorry, do you believe okay. the Iraqi army is actually in a position to be able to um, counter this threat that's coming from the ISIL? Well, I think uh, clearly the events of the last few days uh, tell us that we need to do more, and that's what we're considering here. Um, and we're in touch with a range of partners around the world, and. Uh, and we'll see what is determined out of those conversations. And just go back to what we were talking about before about Iran. I mm -hmm. mean, given the fact that the United States is obviously equipping and training the Iraqi army, um, do you believe that Iran has a role to do similar things uh, on it for its part? 
Uh, I just, uh, it's these, these statements that they've made are just out in the last sort of 12 hours, um, and I just don't want to get ahead of where we are in our analysis or uh, consideration of what we think would be appropriate. In respect of the statements they've made, mm -hmm. in this situation, in the fact that we have this crisis in Iraq, do you believe that there is a military role for Iran? Again, uh, our focus is on increasing the capacity and doing what we can do as the United States. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this wasn't an issue that was discussed uh, during the talks in Vienna. Uh, I will see if there's more that our team would like so to add about our turn that around, would you, can you say that the administration would oppose the deployment of Iranian troops inside of Iraq to defend to I just defend, don't have anything more government. to add on this front. Uh, obviously, the entire situation is very fluid. I'm happy to talk to our team and see if there's more right. we'd like to say and from here on this try issue. Recognizing that if a question is posed to you in terms of why, uh, in terms of isn't this a failure, you're never going to say, yes, it was a failure. Can I just ask you, why isn't it? Why should it not be seen as a failure, the fact that uh, not only of this, the administration's strategy in, in Iraq, but also in Syria, which you have said played a major role in the bolstering of ISIL and their, their advance. Why, why is it wrong to look at this as a failure? Well, Matt, uh, because uh, I'm not, uh, one, I think the context, the context of what we're looking at here is important. Obviously, the withdrawal from Iraq in 2011 uh, was not a mistake. Um, we, uh, that was a decision made uh, with the Iraqi government, uh, consistent with the U.S.-Iraq Security Agreement, a decision and a timeline that was set out uh, five, let's see, 2011, four, no, longer than that, four year, what year are we? We're in 2014. 2014. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, several, Sometimes it feels like 1936. A decision and a timeline that was set out long before 2011 is, I guess, what I should say, back in 2008, if I remember correctly. And uh, we stand by uh, that decision that was made. Now, obviously, in circumstances like this, uh, there are steps that we've taken, given the increasing threat, whether that's the counterterrorism fund, uh, that this president announced just two weeks ago, or the increase in assistance we've given. We're not going to make an evaluation that something is a success or a failure because we're, an, we're continuing to work on it. It's, it's a, it's, it, it is in the interest of the United States and the interest of a range of countries around the world to, uh, to uh, continue to boost the capacity and take on this threat. Okay, if you can say that the withdrawal, such as it was in 2011, mm -hmm. was not a mistake, which is what you just said, uh, can we? Uh, I presume that means that you think it was not a mistake uh, to withdraw because you didn't have, because you couldn't get a sofa. Is not just just that, but I think the other contextual point here is uh, it would be inaccurate to assume that the small contingent of military that was being discussed at the time would have helped stem or prevent uh, what we're seeing and what we've seen over the last several days and even months. So uh, there are there were factors that we could not have predicted five years ago, um, in four, six years ago, including, Go including um, obviously, uh, the situation on the ground in Syria, and the impact of that. And we've made decisions over the last several months to increase capacity in both cases. Right. But, I mean, some people did predict this, that complete withdrawal, the withdrawal that happened in 2011, would lead to something like this. Maybe not, you know, in this time frame, but that was predicted. So. Uh, by I would pose to these so, same individuals whether they would think that the small contingent of military that was being discussed uh, to leave on the ground would have prevented this, and there, I think the answer would be no. Okay, there is some there, there there is some criticism, or maybe I should say suspicion, that the president, because he campaigned on ending the Iraq War, which he thought was a mistake to begin with, um, really didn't try hard enough to get to negotiate a SOFA with the Iraqis. Can you say that that's false? I would say that's absolutely false. I would remind you that the uh, the timeline was laid out by the prior administration. It wasn't a political decision. So it was, so that you're saying that you, you can rule out that it was, a, that, that it wasn't, see, I don't want to do a double negative, and I'm not, so I'm not trying to trick you. I just, mm -hmm. It was, you can say for sure that the president tried as hard as he could and directed his administration to try as hard as it could to conclude a SOFA with the Iraqi government. I can say that there was no politics involved in the decision making and that there are a range of factors that were considered at the time, now three years ago. I'm obviously not going to dial back or go back in history to, to what was occurring at the time. Well, okay, but when you say not politics, you mean that it wasn't 
simply to fulfill a campaign promise. Mm -hmm. That's what you mean by that? Yes. Um, Iraq or, uh, go ahead, and we'll go to you next in the back. Go ahead. Uh, the U.S. made equipment that ISIL uh, took over from the Iraqi army and <coughs> the money that they took over from the Mosul banks. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything? We do not. Uh, we clearly remain concerned uh, by these reports and the pictures that have been posted online. We're working to obtain solid confirmation on what m assets may have fallen into ISIL's hands and uh, until we do that, and if we do that, I, I doubt we'll have much to According more According to, to the press reports, they are carrying <coughs> some of this equipment to the Syria. I, I've okay. seen those reports, but again, it's our responsibility to have uh, the level of confirmation we can have to, to speak about. And one last thing about the all options that Mr. President has mm -hmm. mentioned today. Are you concerned that ISIL can use the Turkish hostages, for example, to prevent some of these options that they are that you are considering right now, for example, to prevent any drone use in the region, uh, the, to, to uh, they can use these hostages to, to make it bargain, this, this uh, kind of I, I, I think that obviously in any discussion or consideration, there are a range of factors taken into account, and uh, you've seen including civilians, right? But um, you've seen uh, the Vice President uh, make clear and the Secretary that uh, we have uh, we are we have we have uh, made clear to the our Turkish uh, allies that we want to see uh, these hostages be released uh, that we want to see them safe and and obviously that remains the, the case. Yet any of these kind of messages from I mean, from them or through some channels in terms of this this kind of uh, thing. I'm not sure what you're asking. Uh, the, Go ahead. Uh, is ISIL, ISIL has uh, sent this kind of message to, to Turkey or to U.S. Uh, for the options that you are considering? Uh, I, you'd have to ask the Turks, but not to us that I'm aware of, no. I mean, we just we just uh, have been talking about it now. Go ahead. Yeah, my colleague just mentioned the word drone. Um, so I wondered if you could confirm um, reports that the Iraqis have actually asked you for drone help? I'm not going to confirm uh, requests on their behalf. I'm sure if they'd like to speak to it, they will speak to it. When you reach out to so when the president says all options remain on the table, does he also mean that the option of uh, possible drone strikes is on the table? All options aside from boots on the ground. So including drone strikes? All options aside from boots on the ground. Really? That's all right. options? Well, I'm not sure I where mean, you're going I mean, we have a here. nuclear arsenal that's rather large. I'm assuming that that, that, well, that option Matt, is Matt's not on the table. Matt's playing his fantasy war games well, no, over I, here. <laughs> no, but one. It's not, there are several options that are off the table, not just boots on the ground, right? There are a range of options that remain on the table. I'm not going to do a yes or no for every option that's being discussed. Is there discussed. any legal framework that exists that prevents the United States from making a unilateral strike in Iraq right now? Um, I think, again, I would take, we would take into account any legal uh, requirements uh, needed in this and any other case. Because, you know, in the past, when it comes to Libya, Syria, the Osama bin Laden raid, the law is there to be used, um, but it's also has been violated before. I'm familiar with the laws and the history, Lucas, but again, there's, we're still in the discussion and consideration phase here. Go ahead. With, uh, regarding the contacts that uh, Assistant Secretary, Deputy Assistant Secretary, he had it with the local players, the Iraqi players, mm -hmm. beside that, do you have any contacts with the regional players beside Turkey? Any other oh, countries? countries in the region? Yes. Uh, absolutely. I mean, there are, there are contacts every day, and certainly uh, given the situation on the ground, this is a topic of discussion. Uh, what, what is the message to them? I mean, is there to play a role or stay away or what? The message is that uh, the, the security threat posed by ISIL is not just a threat to the Iraqis, it's a threat to the region, uh, and we all need to engage in uh, this effort to help them at this uh, challenging time. My second question regarding ISIL after two days of being fluid and this situation, which is getting worse and worse, do you still, what's your understanding? It's, it's because of ISIL or the other, even other sides in Iraq taking side with ISIL? I mean, they are supporting them, getting bigger. It's more than ISIL. Well, the, our core concern here is ISIL, and that remains the case. Go ahead. You expect the uh, under Secretary Sherman to say this message to the Saudi official she's meeting with today? Uh, I know there was some interest in this. I wasn't able to get a readout of or plans for that. I'll see if there's any plans to read anything out after the meeting. Move on. Uh, oh, did this Iraq or I'd like Iraq? to move on as well. Oh, okay, one more on Iraq and then uh, we'll move on. Do you, uh, do you believe that Prime Minister Maliki is doing enough to forge national unity in Iraq and what more? 
Well, I think I've said uh, in here a few times, but it's worth uh, reiterating that uh, there's more that Prime Minister Maliki uh, should have done, could have done over the course of time. Uh, that's a message we've conveyed publicly and privately directly uh, to him. Uh, but the enemy here is ISIL. We need to work together in a and present a unified front. Uh, there have been steps uh, that we've been encouraged by, uh, calling for national unity, and we'll see uh, if that can manifest itself uh, on the ground. Sorry, just because you said that about Maliki, do you do, do you believe the, the does the administration believe that it could have should have and could have done more? Who's you it? It the U.S. Oh, <laughs> you, you say <laughs> that Maliki should, could have and should have done more. Is it the, the opinion what of the I, administration? What, what I was referring I to is the political question. Right, yes. I understand that. But I mean, given the fact that, the, that, that this administration inherited a situation in Iraq that it might not have agreed with, but still had an obligation to bring to a responsible end, do you, is there any concern that you did not do, did, that you could have done and should have done more? Well, uh, clearly, I know this isn't exactly what you're asking, but just to connect the two, what I was referring to is the political component of this. Um, in terms of the uh, assistance front, we've been increasing it over the last several months because of our concerns. No, so no, no, but I'm talking about it politically. I'm not necessarily talking about mil mil okay. militarily. I mean, do you think there is more that you could have and should have done to push Maliki in the direction of uh, greater inclusivity. Well, uh, I think our message of in, of calling on him and others to be more inclusive has been pretty consistent, as you know. Well, we can't yeah, force anyone to take steps uh, uh, just because we feel that they are the necessary steps. So that's continued to be the case. Uh, of course, uh, you know, we continue to press and hope that this will be uh, a, a reason to do so. Do you have proof on Maliki's uh, call for a state of emergency? Uh, my understanding is that um, the parliament failed to reach a quorum and did not act on this request. Uh, so uh, our focus now is on, uh, on uh, you know, all parts of the government coming together. Uh, Iraq's constitution permits the parliament to declare states of emergency, uh, but again, it doesn't seem that that has been the case here. Well, if you can say that you're disappointed in the army, in the, in the, in the Iraqi armed forces for their collapse, apparently, uh, are you disappointed in the fact in, in the state of parliamentary democracy and well, it's a, in, in that they can't even get they can't even get a quorum? It's a it's a lame duck parliament, Matt. So I think that's well, just the nature of where things are standing at this moment. But so. per, but presumably, you know, if the, if the capital of the United States was threatened, the Congress would be able to muster a quorum to declare some kind of a state of emergency. No. Well, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe I don't, I don't have any you're not additional expression. I'm just here basically to okay. You don't. You're not. You I can't. Don't you don't. Any. You're not. You, can, you. You can't say that you're disappointed in the parliament for not being able to. Uh, I. I, I am not choosing to okay. do that. Scott, go ahead. May we move on. Mm -hmm. Venezuela. Yeah. The Venezuelan government has asked Interpol to arrest three Venezuelan opposition leaders who are living here in the United States and arrange their extradition to Venezuela. Is that a request that the United States government intends to comply with? Well, Scott, as you know, uh, we don't speak to extradition requests, um, so there's very little that I have to add on this front. Uh, I will see if there's more uh, that we can convey in terms of our concerns about the overarching message it's sending. What about the request to have these uh, opposition leaders detained? Uh, well, I think uh, you're familiar with our uh, view uh, broadly here that the focus needs to be on uh, having a dialogue between all sides, and uh, there have been a range of accusations launched against not just the United States, but opposition leaders in the country, and uh, that hasn't been an, a productive approach to what we're seeing on the ground. Can I yield more time to myself? Sure. Um, <laughs> Uganda? Yes. The Secretary Kerry will meet with the Foreign Minister Kutesa uh, this afternoon. Mm -hmm. What are the uh, issues that uh, he plans to discuss? One moment here. <clears throat> uh, well, as you noted, they'll be meeting uh, this afternoon. Um, there are a range of issues that um, we, of course, work uh, with Uganda on, um, including promoting regional security and justice and accountability for perpetrators of atrocities like the LRA. I'm uh, certain that will be part of their discussion, uh, ensuring that life-saving treatment for HIV-AIDS continues to reach those who need it. 
Um, and uh, obviously, they're, they're, they don't have an extensive meeting, so I'm sure there will be a range of topics discussed. But I think uh, the security issues um, and other humanitarian needs will be the focus of the discussion. Does the United States believe that Uganda intends to pursue its pretty public anti-gay agenda at the United Nations? Uh, well, that would certainly be a disappointing step. Uh, we uh, have been clear about uh, our, dis dis our, our views on Uganda's Anti-Homosexuality Act. Uh, we believe it undermines human rights and human dig dignity for all persons in Uganda. And certainly, if that uh, were to be taken to a uh, larger uh, uh, scale, that would be greatly concerning. Um, does the Secretary plan to raise this issue with the Foreign Minister? Uh, well, the human uh, rights I think issue, we the LGBT LGBT issues. We've raised it on a range of occasions. Uh, I will. We will do a readout after the meeting, and we can make clear uh, what topics. Was we there any? Uh, well, I, I suppose this question might be better directed at US to USUN. But w w was there any attempt by the United States to lobby against Foreign Minister Kutesa from being elected to be the president of the next General Assembly? Session? Well, as the the, the election of um, the president of the uh, General Assembly follows a system of regional rotation, uh, and non-members of regional groups aren't a part of the selection process. Uh, so I know, but I'm just, it's worth stating. Um, and so obviously uh, the United States wouldn't have a vote in, in this manner. I didn't ask you if you voted against him. I mm -hmm. asked you if you lobbied countries to vote against him. Uh, I, I don't believe that's a role that we played. Um, I no? would so encourage you to, to talk to the U.S. U.N. Okay, but it. you're not aware if the U.S. opposed. I mean, you oppose other countries getting Certainly. on to the Human Rights Council, getting mm -hmm. on to all the time. So I just want to know if, you, if there was any kind of effort to prevent Uganda um, generally, and Mr. Kutesa specifically, from being elected to this position? Uh, not that I'm aware of, Matt. I'd encourage you to, to as, you, as you may already do, ask that question to the UN. Go ahead, Joe. Can we stay with the Secretary's meetings? He's meeting today with um, the Australian Prime Minister, um, mm -hmm. Tony Abbott. What's the focus of the meeting going to be about? What issues are going to be discussed? Well, uh, as you know, uh, this, the President also just met with um, Prime Minister Abbott. Uh, we work with Australia, of course, on a range of issues. Um, and uh, including security. I know there was a fact sheet and information put out by the White House uh, on the force posture agreement. I'm sure they'll discuss that. Um, obviously, there's a, an upcoming Osman meeting this summer in <coughs> August. I'm sure they'll discuss the agenda for that. And we work with Australia on a range of security issues, economic issues. Uh, so I'm sure it will be a wide-ranging discussion. Do you know if uh, the Secretary plans to raise the issue with um, Prime Minister Abbott about that Australia has decided to remove the term occupied uh, when it refers to East Jerusalem. It says that um, the, this term is freighted with pejorative implications and is neither appropriate nor useful. Does the Secretary intend to raise this and generally what is the uh, US view on this uh, removal of the term occupied? Uh, I have not uh, I, I'm, I've not seen this on the agenda, uh, but again, a range of topics often come up in meetings and um, I'm happy to to provide all of you with a readout once the meeting is concluded. Um, uh, I, you know where our position is on this issue. I don't think we have any uh, other particular comments on their own internal politics. But it's, Australia is breaking ranks with other countries which do use the term occupied East Jerusalem. Is that not a matter of concern for you? Well, I think you know where uh, we stand and a range of countries stand, as you said, and uh, I'm not sure if this will be a topic uh, in, in the meeting that will cover a range of important strategic issues, but uh, I'm happy to to provide that or an update once the meeting concludes. Can we stay on that? Just not on the occupied issue, but on, on the yeah. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen the reports about the autopsy of these uh, Palestinian uh, teenagers who were killed? And if you have, or even if you haven't, what do you make of the reports? Um, we've seen reports uh, that say that the op autopsy found uh, that Nadim Nawara was killed by live ammunition. Uh, we express our condolences again uh, to his family. Uh, we remain deeply concerned by the incident and are closely following the Israeli investigation. Given its investigation, I don't think we're going to have a further comment on it. You mean until the investigation is over? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd like to go back to Asia. Mm -hmm. um, I asked about this yesterday, but today the Chinese and the Japanese are trading accusations over who was responsible for the close encounter uh, that the Japanese protested recently. Uh, the Chinese Defense Ministry actually released a video that they say suggests that the Japanese are responsible for this. So I wanted to know if you've seen the video and if you have any comments on it. 
I have not seen the video. Um, I will just, uh, you know, reiterate that we urge all states to ensure that they respect the safety of aircraft in flight. Uh, these reports reinforce the need for China and its neighboring countries to develop crisis management procedures that can avoid miscalculations or further incidents at sea or in air. And any attempt uh, to interfere with freedom of overflight in international airspace raises uh, re regional tensions and increases the risk of miscalculation, confrontation, and unintended incidents. Does the State Department attribute any blame on either side for this encounter? Uh, I think, uh, again, uh, we've been clear that um, we've expressed concerns in the past about uh, China's uh, declaration of an aid is. Um, I don't know that this was part of that, um, uh, but uh, we continue to urge all sides to ensure that they respect the safety of aircraft in flight, and obviously uh, I don't have additional details on this specific incident. Uh, go ahead in the back. On Ukraine, mm -hmm. there's been reports recently that three tanks have crossed the Russian border into Ukraine. I was wondering if you had any confirmation, mm -hmm. and if proven true, would this be a step that warrants further sanctions? Mm-hmm. I think I do have something on this. Um, unfortunately, I'm not sure I have it with me. So why don't we uh, get that to you and anyone else who's interested after the briefing. Go, Is go it, ahead. well, can we stay in Ukraine for a second? Mm -hmm. And just, do you remember at all what it was? Is it a confirmation? Uh, again, I, I, I think it's probably sitting on my desk right <coughs> now, and it came out right before the briefing. Right, so the, let me, we'll venture to get that out to all of you shortly after. There were the reports yesterday that um, the Ukrainian military is using phosphorus, white phosphorus bombs and attacking Slavyansk. Do you know anything about that? Did that come up in the conversation between Secretary Kerry and Foreign Minister Lavrov, if there was one last there, night? There was <coughs> one yesterday, and actually I did find what I wanted to say on the vehicle, so let me get to that after I get to Matt's question. So well, thank you for your patience. Okay, um, we've seen uh, the media reports that three Russian tanks and other military vehicles may have crossed the border into eastern Ukraine in the border town of Shniznya. Uh, we have long condemned the flow of Russian fighters and arms into Ukraine as destabilizing and, vi and a violation of Russia's Geneva commitments. If these latest reports are true, uh, which I don't have confirmation of, this incursion marks a serious and disturbing escalation of the crisis in eastern Ukraine. Uh, as you know, uh, there are a range of factors we look at uh, as it relates to consequences. I don't have anything to outline on that front uh, at this point in time. Uh, your question, I'm sorry, was about, about the phone the use of call phosphorus? and about phosphorus. Yeah. Uh, the secretary did speak with Foreign Minister Lavrov um, just yesterday afternoon. Um, they discussed two issues: uh, the ongoing situation on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, they did not talk about that specific issue. The secretary encouraged. Uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov to encourage President Putin to directly engage with President Poroshenko. We've seen reports that they had a phone call uh, today. Uh, he also uh, encouraged uh, that conversation or engagement to focus on de-escalating the situation on the ground, and he called on Russia to halt the flow of militants and arms from Russia into eastern Ukraine, uh, which is clearly uh, relevant in this case. Uh, they also discussed Syria's chemical weapons program. The Secretary made clear that there's no excuse for failing to turn over the remaining 8 percent and asked for Foreign Minister Lavrov's assistance in putting additional pressure on the Syrian um, regime. Even though it didn't come up in their conversation, do you have anything to say about the reports that use phosphorus? And there's some pretty, there's some, you know, what appears to be video and, and photographic evidence of this, of you, the use of this. Of the, by the, by the Russian? No, by the Ukrainians. I have not seen those reports. I'm, I'm happy to check with our team and see if we have uh, <coughs> confirmation of that or more to say right. on that front. And, and the Russians, um, are, do you, are you supportive of the, the resolu excuse me, <coughs> of the resolution at the Security Council that they're preparing or may have already introduced? Uh, we haven't, they haven't yet shared, to my knowledge, or when I came down here, uh, a text, a UN Security Council resolution text. Um, our view is that uh, the focus should be on engaging directly with the Ukrainians. We find it hypocritical uh, for the Russian leadership to call for an end to violence or call on uh, the Ukrainians to take these steps when uh, Russian separatists are abetting the violence um, and, uh, and bringing weapons uh, illegally uh, into the country. Uh, but we haven't yet seen the text of, of what they're proposing. But you do think that the violence should end. Correct. Of course we do, but again. Uh, well, I don't understand why it's hypocritical for them to say that. Because that I think it end. depends on what the text is calling for, and if it's focused on Ukrainians taking steps, that is 
clearly okay. different from what the reality is on the ground. Well, what if it's, I mean, what, what if it was both sides? What if the text of both sides should end the violence? Well, we'll, that, we'll, then you would support it? We'll see what the text says, and then All we right. can do some more analysis. And then the last thing is, if the reports of the Poroshenko-Putin call are correct, if they're accurate, is that a good, is that a positive step in your, in your mind? Sure. We would be encouraged by direct engagement, but clearly there's more that needs to be done beyond that. It's a step in the process, but there's more that needs to happen. Ukraine or another topic? Yeah. Iran. Okay. Um, so yesterday, um, the Iranian foreign minister tweeted that the negotiation with the U.S. actually now were, it's at deadlocked over the restriction um, on Iran's centrifuge. Is that the case? Uh, I think we've uh, never gotten into the details so for good reason because our negotiating team and um, the P5 plus one for the most part feels that's the appropriate way to approach these negotiations. Um, the team was on the ground the first couple of days of this week having a bilateral meeting uh, on kind of which has been a normal part of the process all, all along. Uh, they felt that was a good meeting. Uh, gaps remain. Uh, there's no question about that. The negotiations will uh, resume uh, next week and certainly our uh, our efforts will only increase from here. So are you still expecting to achieve a deal before the deadline? Our July. focus remains on the July 20th deadline and that has not changed. Lucas. Ghazi. Mm -hmm. um, Fox News is confirming the presence of a targeting memo that was issued by AFRICOM on September 14th and distributed to members of the State Department, Defense Department, and to the White House, confirming that there were 11 suspects, four of whom were members of AQIM. Um, if this is the case, doesn't this prove that al-Qaeda was involved in the attack all along? Well, uh, I haven't seen the memo that you're referring to, uh, but uh, let's be clear about the history here and what the administration uh, said at the time. We described the perpetrators as terrorists from the beginning. Uh, we have discussed this fact over and over again, of course, uh, from the podium, uh, and that hasn't changed. There's been extensive efforts to look into what happened here, but uh, the question was uh, was uh, was about, of course, who they were, who exactly they were, and uh, whether there was also a demonstration. And as you know, there have been countless hearings and uh, and efforts to look into the details here. Uh, Why did it take two years for this memo to get to Congress? Well, there's been, uh, Lucas, as you know, an ongoing effort to review and uh, produce documents. And uh, given the range and the number of requests, um, that has taken some time. And uh, there are uh, issues that need to be taken into account before documents are released uh, to Congress. But we've released tens of thousands of documents, and that speaks to our commitment to this issue. Now, Hillary Clinton in her book said that on Benghazi, Every step of the way, when something was learned, it was shared with Congress and the American people. So if we're just finding out about this targeting memo and on September 14th, the administration was aware that al-Qaeda was involved, uh, why are we just now learning Well, that? Lucas, I haven't even seen the memo. As you know, there were uh, disputed facts at the time, and uh, I think a range of senior officials have spoken to that in, in testimony, under oath. Um, weeks after, months after, and even uh, recently about the events that happened and what we did or didn't know at the time. So we've produced uh, more documents in this case than, uh, than, uh, than I think uh, in almost any case in recent memory. We'll, we'll continue to uh, be, uh, provide as much information as we can, but I'd remind you that this issue has been litigated heavily by a range of senior officials over the course of time. But do you delay the litigation? Do you, are you slowing people down by this tranche of documents you're releasing, if you're releasing tens and 20,000 pages worth of documents. We've released tens of thousands of documents. Tens of thousands we've released. Was there a new, was there a new tranche <coughs> of documents? That was no, he's released? referring to a, a report of a memo that was, uh, that was reported. But again, uh, I, I have, our view is it doesn't tell us anything uh, new that hasn't been discussed, reviewed, analyzed uh, in 50 briefings, countless testimonies. Uh, and uh, and all of the focus that has gone on to this issue. But it's not something that, well, I, I'm not sure I understand it. We, this is a, a new memo. Or, I mean, a, it's an old memo, obviously, from, from September 14th. From September 14th. But it was just released? Uh, I believe it, he's talking about something that may have been given to Congress, but I haven't even seen the memo. I don't know what well, date it may well, have been given. Okay, but, but you, you're not aware that there's been a new, I mean, you've told, said all along that you're, releasing documents as fast as you mm -hmm. can, it, but it takes time. Is, has, 
Has there been some new batch of stuff that's been turned over to the Hill in the last uh, couple of days? No, two not that I'm aware of. Six o'clock Eastern. I, I'm not sure when where this came from, but it's not related to a new batch that's been given to my okay. knowledge. Uh, great. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you.